Hey, Dave, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. No, this is, this is, and I've said this before we jumped on here, the biggest honor I can ever have. Top, top, you will be number one guest of all time because... Oh. Yeah, you know, I can think of twenty people that are better than me. No, me personally. All right, okay. because you are one of the many inspirations in my life of of like of just what I thought sneaker, what being inside the sneaker culture was like. You are an integral part. I remember. Uh, well, first of all, you want to <laughs> people who aren't familiar with you. Let's uh, okay, introduce I'll, yourself. I, I, all right. My name is Dave Ortiz. <laughs> I am the ex-owner of Dave's Quality Meat, a.k.a. DQM. <laughs> I opened the store in 2003, and I have a history in skateboarding and BMX, art, um, dance, club culture. Mm -hmm. I've done so many different things. Um, I opened the first distillery in Manhattan. Um, yeah, and I, and now I'm just, I live upstate and I make paintings and I'm, you know, I'm just a regular dude. That's just, you know, just trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents and having a good time doing it. No, I mean, that's, that's what I really enjoy about who you are and, who, and like what you've always represented. Cause I mean, we've never met, right. I was going to say, well, we probably I, met at my store. I mean, I was going to say like, I've definitely have had like a small little convo with you but i wouldn't consider that me being like hey my name's Hassan." like well uh, it starts sweating down my face like i am right now but but but, but i remember just to just just because this is why um i want to just say like how much of an influence you are on me personally where it's just like i remember hearing about the store on the forums and never and never like i was a big nike sb kid when i was growing up and you so like talk I was I was on NikeSB.org, so oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. I was I was on Nike Talk for a little bit, but like nothing didn't grab me. Not like NikeSB.org because it was more family. It felt like you were in a family. Sure, right? sure, I remember that website. And so I remember somebody said, hey, "Have you ever been to Dave's Quality Meats?" And I was like, "No." And they were like, "Dude, it's like you're going to like a butcher shop. You have to go." And, and so I take like three of my friends who's never also been there uh, also with me and I remember having like I think like 70 bucks and I just like la like that's all I had on me. And I went in there and I bought like anything that could fit me, but I'm still a fat guy. So like you didn't have a, like the store didn't have a lot of like anything above XL. You didn't have double X. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, I remember just trying to grasp onto, like, okay, maybe this fits and this. And, like, I was just captivated by by what the store represented and how everybody was so chill. And so, like, I, I it became of, if I'm going to Soho, I started Days Quality Meets. And then I just do, like, a little, I just, roll, yeah, I did the trek. Yeah. Like, Us, Recon, mm -hmm. Classic Kicks, Supreme, obviously. Um, clientele. Clientele. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gnome de Guerre. No de Guerre, uh, go to like David Z's to see what is like this, whatever's left, like the, yeah, yeah. The, that little spot on. Um, I mean, yeah, it was just I always go in there. I used to spend like, and I think this is after you sold it, I, I was spending like a, like a couple hours every time I would go there. Like, I was just, I, I was mean, just I'm like, glad yeah. that you, you, you know, you spent time and you saw, you know, you took time to, you know, look at the detailing of the stuff that we were doing because. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people were just kind of making things. And I felt like we were trying to do stuff that was different, you know, with, t with our T-shirt graphics, you know, making them, as, doing theme shirts. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the stuff that I was always influenced by were like old movies. I did a lot of movie posters and, mm -hmm. and, and rock music. You know, nobody was doing rock and roll. And I was doing like heavy metal T-shirts, like Killers from mm -hmm. Iron Maiden and The Misfits. And, yeah. And you were right next to CBGB too, so yeah, I was. I mean, yeah. I used to go there as a kid, mm -hmm. and it was like, you know, being a kid going there for Sunday matinee shows, and you see like Bad Brains or or the Ramones and 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 weird shit like that, and all sorts of different bands, and a lot of that stuff, you know, I carried over mm -hmm. into what we were doing at the store, and because it was part of my life, you know, and and I wanted to let people like you know, it, it's our 
it's our obligation to teach the young generation like, oh man, this is cool. You know, you could find what's cool too, but let me tell you about this, you know, and we would do things like that. And, and most people at the time, they were like, what is this, you know, you know killer's t-shirt. And, and they, they just saw the graphic. And just like me, when I was a kid, when I saw the graphic of Iron Maiden, I was mm-hmm. just like, fuck, I need this. This is dope. Yeah. And, um, that's all it took. And then once I started listening to the records, I was like, I was hooked. You know? Yeah, I think. And especially that area, too, because like back then it was was a lot of like, I'm not going to say grunge kids because it's, it's after grunge, but it's like in that in between. It was, it was a lot of it, new metal was, and like it was a lot of <laughs> different, you know, kids that were walking around, you know, but but again, the sneaker game is always very it was very hip hop. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to kind of do what I was into. I like hip hop. I grew up on hip hop, but I also like rock music and heavy metal. Yeah. And I was like, I'm just going to do this because nobody's doing it. And no, yeah. I just did it. And I really did. I never cared what anybody thought. I was just like, I'm just going to make it. Mm-hmm. And we'll see what happens. And people gravitated towards it and liked it. And to this day, I still get like, you know, DMs like somebody has an old rock, one of my rock shirts and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. like, oh shit, that's cool. <laughs> I mean, I got a ton of your old hats. So <laughs> I should probably show you. I should show you. I should show you them. <laughs> I, I mean, this one's one. like this is the one that I'm wearing right now. Is is not? It's like I think this was post, right? This is post. That's after I saw yeah. this changed the logo. They yeah, to, they made it really simple and less, you know, ominous or, or me, yeah. me, 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 meat centric. Yeah, they, they were like, we gotta get away from this chicken leg thing. This is kind of crazy. <laughs> you know, that was his tag. <laughs> we're just gonna be this. <laughs> Oh man, I mean, yeah, but we're here to talk about your first pair, and I'm here, and I ask the same question to everybody each week. Sorry for all the fumbling. I may be fumbling throughout this episode, uh, because, like I said, I'm nervous. But <laughs> I'm here to ask you, what's your first kicks? What's that first pair of sneakers you absolutely needed to have? Oh, uh, it was definitely the Puma Clyde. I had them in blue and white, and then I had them in black and white, mm-hmm. and it was part of the that was the breakdance uniform. You had, sure. blue, you had the, the blue and white with the blue leaves with the blue um, BVD tank top mm-hmm. and then the white t-shirt BVD. So it was like a two, two tone thing going. And then you had a Kango and you had, I never rocked the bell Kango cause that mm-hmm. shit was crazy. I was a little too much, but I did have the, the, the cat. Me- yeah. I was going to say like the messenger hat. <laughs> yeah. I had the cabbie hat and um, you know, and then you would like pop lock it and all that shit. You had the fat laces. So that was part of the uniform. Mm-hmm. And I had to have those. And the funny thing about it was when I finally got a pair, I remember, you know, probably like a week into having them. Mm-hmm. I went over to my friend's house, um, these two dudes, Ricky and Ramon, and we were playing hide and seek in their basement. And I went to hide behind this like door that was like leaning against the wall and I like put my foot back behind the door Mm -hmm. and I stuck my toe Mm -hmm. into a can of brown paint (laughs) and I ruined my sneakers and then my mom's was like fuck that and 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 my dad tried to help me clean them and he put like uh turpentine on them and then they were like it was so fucked and I just had to rock them like that and then I tried to like paint them in with blue marker it was a mess <laughs> but um yeah uh, i'll be mean, that sad but <laughs> let me give a little synopsis for people who are if, if you aren't familiar with the puma clyde uh in 1972 puma signed an endorsement agreement with walt the glide clyde frazier i don't know it, it, he's always the crazy he's his uh if you never listen to a knicks game He's he's the most eloquent the on the road. And he yeah. always had the dopest outfits. Yeah. He still um, does have the dopest Oh outfits. yeah, for sure. Last I think the game before, not tonight's game, but the game before on Saturday, uh, he they're playing Celtics and he had something crazy on. It was like super like vibrant and bright. I was just like, man, you gotta start yeah, making he's, Clyde's he's like best. this. Yeah. <laughs> um uh he wanted a low style to play in and wanted to wear a new colorway in every game allegedly over 390 different colors were used this was the reason why the shoe was made out of suede leather so that it was easier to dye and i think like this so 
I'm a huge hip hop head. So like learning about the Clyde and like what it meant to be boy, be boy culture, I always try to get a pair, but it, my mom never let me get it. So oh. <laughs> damn, it was like I mean. I, I mean, I couldn't break this, but I did. I was in. It's funny you brought this memory back to me. But um, I was in high school and I joined the hip hop club at oh. high school. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I totally, I totally forgot about this until until oh, until this. Oh, and I, and they were they like brought in somebody who actually was like good at pop and lock in. So we we're all just there, like, yeah, we just got to learn how to pop and lock. And then like. The, uh, somebody, the dude at the end, he just goes, all right, everybody, your homework is to go to the mirror and do this for like 30 minutes. Uh, and then they were just like, you do the wave for 30 minutes and you have so that you can get the, the back pattern coming back yeah, this sure. way. And I didn't, I just quit. I, I quit hip hop club right after that. <laughs> You're like, just ain't for me. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I mean, like, I, I was just like the one thing about for me so like i always wanted to be a rapper and then like in high school it just cut it, it was just like hell no no more i'm done i'm done with it <laughs> I mean, being a rapper you have to be a linguistic person. yeah you, know, you have to know words and um it's not easy it's not it's not um I think it's easy but it's not <laughs> uh what was it like like you know after puma like were you part of the 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 craze that was after that or were you always just on your own doing your own thing i always did my own thing you know mm -hmm. I, mean, I got a few pairs of shell toes and then you know skateboarding you know we would go to models and you could buy um jordans because mm -hmm. they were good to skate in and mm -hmm. um you, you know they weren't like what what jordans were today you know this is 1987 we were getting them at models mm -hmm. you get the blue and black fairly easy you know those were for some reason very much available red and blacks weren't that much available but mm -hmm. the blue and blacks were always around you could always find them and um got some of those and then I, you know i i got um ewings mm -hmm. high top ewings because i um, i liked the ankle support while i was riding my bmx and um but i really never really cared about sneakers i never you know I understood the value of them. Mm -hmm. And I always said to, you know, in the beginning, I was like, you know, getting into sneakers is a good business because everybody's going to need a pair. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. You always need a pair of sneakers. So especially in New York, everybody's always dip. So you've got to be fresh. And mm -hmm. um, it was a smart move in that, in terms of that. But I was never a sneaker head, like, until this day i mean i any any pair of shoes i get i just mm -hmm. wear them i really don't even care if they're rare or not i'm just like i'm just gonna uh, great it goes with this outfit i'm just gonna wear them and then i'll end up in my studio painting and then they get paint on them and i'm just mm -hmm. like whatever on to the next no i mean yeah i think it's like uh, now and i and i think this is like where i i get more of my sensibilities behind sneakers it's like the story you're able to tell in them right or the story yeah. that comes like the shoes themselves are more of just a conveyor of just like you know you're able to to style them to whatever you think is best to make you feel good like i think it's more about like to me it's more about what it makes you feel inside for you right mm -hmm. versus like what i think is the norm or what is being perceived as like this is what sneakerhead is like you have to be this fresh you have to have the hot the, the hot stuff and all this other stuff and i think a lot of that those sensibilities are something that just does not connect with me and um and I, I definitely credit that to like you know doing the rounds and going around like to your store and like back in the day and and seeing what like like people were more about like starting a conversation about what you're wearing or like this is where you can find the common interest and yeah. and, and become friends after that not like this is the status quo and, and you're not meeting these standards and all this other stuff you know well a lot of times you know I always wore the sneak and nobody wanted, mm -hmm. you know, I would, it's funny because I remember I was having this conversation online with this kid and then um, I was like, let's do a FaceTime chat, you know, and we were talking and he was like, so what should I start collecting? And I was like, 
honestly. I hate that question. I hate that question so much. <laughs> and I said, I said, honestly, I said, you know what you got to do? I said, go to your local store, whichever it is, Foot Locker, uh, Jams, or whatever the fuck it mm -hmm. is, right? And I said, look at the general release wall and pick something you like. And if you like it, buy two or three pairs because mm -hmm. that's future dead stock. Because they're not going to make that shoe because it's not as hot mm -hmm. right now. And you might pick something that's going to be super dope later. Mm -hmm. And you got them now and you're going to be rocking them. And I say, I said, I swear to you, eight to 10, maybe 12 years from now, that shoe that you thought nobody wanted is going to be the shoe everybody wants. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the Nike 180. Mm -hmm. When that came out, everybody thought it was dorky. I always thought that was a cool sneaker. I, that, I gravitated towards that. I always wore the sneaker that nobody wanted. A, it was cheaper. B, not everybody was wearing it, so I don't look like everybody. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, that's how I tell people. I was like, yo, you just got to invest in future dead stock. There's no such thing as dead stock anymore. No, there isn't. You know, everything is reselled and it's there and they got them. So what's the future? So you got to invent the future dead stock. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm definitely in that same ballpark of just like, if I see something that appeals to me, I'm just I like, and it, there's definitely stuff that just sits and I'll just be like, yo, let me just get that. I'm going to be the one that's wearing it. This is this, this for me, like, you know, yeah. and versus being like, oh, every week, just like getting what everybody else is getting. I think it's, it also is easier on the pockets, which is just a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> so much easier on the pockets. Uh, what, how did you, how did you even get into like skateboarding and BMXing? Like, is it, um, is it, a, is it everywhere uh, back then? No, it wasn't everywhere. I mean, I grew up in East New York, Brooklyn. So <laughs> skating and BMX was like this foreign thing that kids in California did. And they would call me white boy. You know what I mean? And, um, I had a BMX bike. And it all started basically from the 70s, you know, Evil Knievel. Mm -hmm. And I used to have a Schwinn Stingray, just like every fucking kid. And we <laughs> used to jump, you know, stack tires and put a piece of wood and then jump it. Yeah. You know? And then bikes, a uh, few BMX bikes came out. And, we, you know, we would go to like 7-Eleven. Um, and then there was like these motocross magazines and you look at the motocross magazines and then they would have an advertisement for a, you know, a Huffy. Mm -hmm. And then there was the, the Ross MX times. And then it was like these, these race bikes. And we were like, Whoa. And then, you know, that's how I got into it and then saved my money, got a frame, you know, I built it up. It was a little janky. And then as time went on, you know, you just kept, searching for like-minded kids in different neighborhoods and i would ride my bike for fucking eight to ten hours a day go to different neighborhoods you know search for kids and then you find kids and then you know then we were like in in woodhaven queens and then we ventured into manhattan and then we went to the brooklyn banks and then there was a gang of kids and it was like oh you do this too and then they were like we all hang out at washington square park and then you go to washington square park and it was like Oh, this and, and that's how I got into it. And then before I knew it, you know, the more you ride and the more you're with other kids who ride that are good, you mm -hmm. start getting good. And then yeah. I started getting really good. And then I got sponsored. And then who was your first sponsor? Um, it was this local bike shop. Uh, what was the name of it? It was like Jamaica Cycles or some shit like that. In Jamaica, Queens? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 116 street i think that was it anyways i don't remember the name of the actual store mm -hmm. but it was a weird store they sold skateboards and bikes and fishing equipment and you know um, <laughs> hobby toys like trains and shit like that yeah cars. so yeah and then you know i met a bunch of people and i started um i started a zine back in the day in mm -hmm. 87 i had a zine called mental youth which uh, me and my friend Chu, we put together and we would, it was pretty, you know, basic, you know, zero. Were you going to, were you going to like, I, was this high school? Like, were you going to high yeah, school? Yeah, we were in high school. Oh. In 87, I was in high school. Did you go to like high school, like an art and design or like? No, no, I went to this like vocational high school. Was, I think it was for like auto trade. 
and we learned how to fix cars and shit like that. It was called mm. Franklin K Lane. Mm. And that was in Jamaica, Queens. And um, I had three friends. And I had, <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was me, it was Adi, mm -hmm. it was Bingo, and then it was Chu, and then there was this other, this other dude, Kike. I, I love these names. Four friends. <laughs> I love these names. <laughs> yeah, and then and then we started like getting a few more dudes like Domingo. Uh -huh. and Domingo became a huge producer uh, in hip hop. Yeah, uh, I know who Domingo is. I've actually have hung out with Domingo. Yeah, if you ever see him again, tell him you met you know uh, B Dave. All right, well, well. Cause he 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 usually he does he has done songs with uh I don't know if you, there's a rapper named Tone Deaf or yeah, yeah yeah that he's like kind of the homie for me uh I was actually on like he had a he had a a record label for a little bit and uh QM five and I was on the I was on the street team for that as well. Domingo used to rap BMX with us. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Domingo. Then there was. Um... Oh, this kid kid named Marv. That was his name. Uh huh. Marv. <laughs> Marv. <laughs> and then, and then it was just like we started growing. And yeah. Then, you know, with this other crew, and we met this dude, and then we started like going to Rockaway Beach, and then we got into surfing. And this was like '89, and we were all like either surfing or bodyboarding, and then we met a bunch of kids named one kid Hair Long. And, Aaron and Eli and, and Froggy mm -hmm. and, and we would just surf and, and and those guys skated and then we would meet them at the banks and ride with them and you know it just it all this whole like action sport and then winter would come around and we all you know one dude had a snowboard and yeah like, all right we're gonna snowboard and we just start snowboarding and that was it it was like it was all about this like freedom of movement and this mm -hmm. counterculture and you know this is back and i was still kind of writing graffiti but i kind of stopped like i was writing graffiti in, in 1981 mm -hmm. to like 1988 you know really like trying to bomb and yeah graffiti writer and then i was just like then i found my bike and my skateboard and i was just like this is it but i always took tags like i always got up Mm -hmm. at, you know i wasn't like trying to like be like fucking ja or anything but i knew <laughs> shout out ja i don't know where he is right now but shout out ja <laughs> he just and, disappeared um, man yeah, he he's disappeared around. he's still around <laughs> he's still around he's still fucking doing highways man <laughs> and, and i met a bunch of dudes and, mm -hmm. and it was just like all these like-minded kids that were just like me you know that we just you know, we would figure it out. We never knew what the fuck we were doing. We were just figuring it out. And then I That's met cool. this one kid um, mm -hmm. through my zine. His name is Eli Gessner, who who ended up becoming the creative director of New York. Mm -hmm. And me and Eli hit it off. We were like two fucking nerds. And he loved my zine. And then he, he got me a job at this nightclub called Mars. And then that's what that movie um was. i was just yeah i was just about to say i just recently saw that movie and i i saw it and i was just and it just like when we were there yeah it was kind of crazy because when I, you know i never really thought about it mm -hmm. but it was all these kids running this club yeah and <laughs> like, it's the craziest thing <laughs> it was literally 17 and 18 year olds and a sprinkle of one or two 21 year olds mm -hmm. in there with us and then the owner yuki and yeah. rudolph and it was just a fucking bunch of kids that is wow. i mean it's so crazy watching that document and i didn't even know you were a part of it like that is because like i was thinking about that like how crazy it was because you can't even do that now right you can't oh. have like a gaggle of kids even a, just like a no. moderate amount of group and before you're all of a sudden now you're like a gang now so like to have a whole nightclub of just kids and just like un unsupervised like just was, just, just going just wild mayhem and it was so much fun and <laughs> and then we got to meet all these dudes these hip-hop artists like mm -hmm. you know i still I, uh, you know relatively friendly with the dudes in in, in de la soul and mm -hmm. and if i see them around they're like oh what's up and i you know we're like hey you know i'm good friend Clark Kent was skinny and worked there and he had glasses and, mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and Stretch Armstrong and all these dudes, Moby, Jesus Christ, Moby had hair. <laughs> like I know I've known Moby since he had hair. <laughs> he had hair and he had a goatee and he had a picture of Jesus behind him with a tambourine. And that motherfucker looked like Jesus. We used to call him DJ Jesus. DJ Jesus. That's crazy. I, I mean, I like like I want I wish I was there because I I remember talking to somebody just asking them about the tunnel and like I forgot who it was. I was maybe it might have been Dante Ross. So I was just like, what was the tunnel like? Because like I don't get I, like I'm not I was not born in, in or like I, first of all, my mom wouldn't even leave me. Let me leave Queens. So I wasn't going to go to any club at like 12, 13. So it's not it's not going to happen. Yeah. So like <laughs> complete like it was a different era in the 80s. Mm hmm. And like, I mean, it was so fucked up that they had to make commercials where they had to ask parents, it's yeah. 10 o'clock. Do you know where your kids are? <laughs> like, that's how fucking crazy it was. The kids were gone. Like we were gone. <laughs> and, and how do you, what do you, what happens when you, you get home at like four in the morning or like five in the morning? Would get, I would get home. I would yeah. come in because I had a basement apartment. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm coming through the basement. My parents would never hear me. I'd get up and go to school. They barely even saw me. That's as crazy. Long as, as long as I had good grades, they yeah. really didn't give a fuck. They were like, all right, he's not failing in school. So, what, you know. Everybody else is struggling at the party. They're, just, uh, they're all got like E's, E's and F's. <laughs> I, I really like, honestly, I'm, I'm like one of these nerdy kids that mm -hmm. kind of like can pull shit off like yeah i could study the night before and just fucking do it mm -hmm. and was able to pull it off i remember I, my friend Adi had to take the sats mm -hmm. he wasn't so 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 smart and i fucking snuck in to the room <laughs> with him he gave me his test i took his sat for him and handed it back to him <laughs> And he passed. He got a fucking amazing. I forgot what he what grade he got, but he got a high score. And he got he was able to graduate. Like that's how that's how crazy. Like I can't. I can't. Yeah, yeah. I can't. Oh my god. I've never heard that. I've never heard that. I've heard like people be like, yeah, man, you know, I figured out a way to just like, you know, uh cram all these like three months of SAT into like uh two weeks and i was just like you're not retaining any of it i i didn't even i took like one psat and i was just like that's it this is what i'm gonna get if i'm getting this here i'm getting this in, in the actual real thing so whatever i, think I got him a 14 or 18 something i forgot what it was it was it was, it was like equivalent to having a, about an 85 85 so probably like i mean that's probably 1600 was probably the highest yeah. then so maybe like 1350 or something like that something like that yeah. yeah 13 or 14 it was great. You got him a scholarship for sure. That's what you got him. <laughs> and, yeah, it was hilarious because, you know, I, I wanted him to continue to ride with me. I didn't want him to stay in school. So... <laughs> <laughs> like, no, <laughs> you're coming out with me. Uh, who am I going to ride with? <laughs> I can't be out here by myself. <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> And then I got him a job at Mars. He was a DJ. He was a great DJ too. Yeah. You yeah. were you able to DJ or no? Were no, you... no. I was a promoter. I, mm. was a promoter. I could I could see that. Out, just coming, being like, yeah. Coming. And we would just make shit up, and it was hilarious. It's <laughs> absolutely like I that documentary. When you see it, and you see all the kids that are running it, you're like, those kids are six, 17, 16, mm -hmm. fucking eighteen year old kids. I was 18 when I first started. I, I, I got my job there. That's crazy. I mean, it, it, like, I mean, I, it, like, I wouldn't it, give an 18 year old anything. No, no. <laughs> I like, I, I, it's crazy how that, because like it does blend into uh, the the launch of Supreme and the film the filming of kids um, and just like you get you get a little I get to because like so I have a Supreme collab with a picture of Harold Hunter on it 
um mm -hmm. it's like their comme des garçons but it's the jacket and yeah. so like i'm like i've always did not know who this was and, and they never said it like when they dropped the collab like oh this is a picture of harold hunter in on this and so like i was just like i guess i just have like a random black kid on my jacket and then <laughs> <laughs> and then and then i watched this documentary i'm like i'm like is this the dude that's on my jacket? And then he, I learned so much about Harold Hunter. I was like, man, this guy is great. Like he, it, it was he was, really, he was, he was amazing. Yeah. He was like my little brother. Me and him. Oh, the stories I could tell you. <laughs> mm. I mean, you got, you could tell, you can tell one right now. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, he was just, a, he was a special kind of fucking crazy person. Yeah. And he used to like, <laughs> he, he, he liked, he liked older women. Mm -hmm. and and he, one day he was like arguing with me he would argue with like if he loved you he argued with you mm -hmm. and and if he knew you he never he was super polite and nice but he just always would argue with me and he was arguing with me about some shit and he's like you know i like mothers why are you gonna blow up my spot and i was like, <laughs> like <laughs> and i was like why do you like mothers and he's like don't the sheets they got clean sheets yo <laughs> He's like, they don't got dirty sheets. The sheets are soft. They got the good, clean cotton. <laughs> I was like, hey, he's kind of right. He's kind of right. yeah, They do do laundry. Like <laughs> laundry. I was like, all right, I got you. Yeah, I'm really, I'm yeah. But, yeah. I mean, we used to just wild out me and him. He, he was a great guy. I love that guy. Shout out. Rest in peace. Shout out. But like, yeah. I like that documentary was just I did not know this ever happened and learning about it and learning about Zoo York and stuff like that. Just like the 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 New York street culture, street skates culture was like, I mean, it, it influenced the world. Yeah. And I was just going to say, like, because I mean, um, what's his name? Mid 90s, the director from mid 90s, I forgot. Jonah, Jonah Hill. Oh, they yeah. do. Yeah, they did like a ode to it, to to like collecting uh stretch and bobito tapes and and going skating every single day and like i thought i thought that was dope to 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 just like see what really happened during that time is is just mind-blowing and i wish i was outside Funny, during that time me and john are really good friends mm -hmm. and uh, when when he he filmed the movie and then he he asked me to watch it you know like rough cut and he was like what do you think of this and then i was just the first thing i told him i said the wheels are wrong. <laughs> and he was like, he's like, dude, I know. He's like, the smallest wheel I could find was a 55. I was like, dude, they were riding 52s. Yeah. The, the little wheels. Yeah, the little and baby wheels. And he, and, and he said that they, um, in post-production, they were going to shave them down and make them smaller. So much work. So much work just to get them the right size. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Jonah's a great kid. And, and, and you know, he did... He did a really great movie with that because mm -hmm. he really portrayed what a kid goes through, a kid went through in that time. Mm -hmm. you know? And like I was saying, you know, like like that kid in that movie, he had his crew, those were his homies, and he yeah. was this outcast kid who got in, and that he that's all he cared about. And it was the same thing with me. I found my crew, and that's all I cared about. And I did anything to keep that crew together, and I took my friend's SAT test for him, just to keep us a close knit so we could go ride together mm -hmm. and we could skate pools and ride pools and, and, and so on. And, and it was, you know, I'd, I'd do anything for my crew. Man, I wish, I wish not to sound make, make this sad. I wish it was like that now. <laughs> it's not like that now. It's kind of weird. But again, none of us, we, we just had each other. Yeah. We're like these derelict kids mm -hmm. who raised each other. And that was, and it's different now, you know, with social media and everybody's kind of like, you know, back then that's all we could focus on. Mm -hmm. There was no distraction. Yeah. You know, other than, yeah, you went to the club or you met some girls and that was a distraction. It was just your bike or your skateboard. Mm -hmm. There really wasn't anything else. You know, when, when the weather got cold, you went snowboarding. Mm -hmm. But it really was just that. And that's all we did. And we were just, that's, anything like that's all i ever wanted to do and that's all i care about to this day like i was like i am never getting a corporate job mm -hmm. because <laughs> i am not that dude and i know that um 
this is the thing that I love and I'm going to figure out a way to keep doing this and somehow generate income so I could continue to live, but I still want to do the thing I love. What, what was, what was the moment where you realized, Oh snap, like this is for real. Um, I think I, I went on tour with Haro, Haro mm-hmm. bikes and I met Ron Wilkinson, Brian Blyther, Dave Murray, Matt Hoffman and Spike Jones and Kevin Martin. And we all, to this day, are all friends. And just being with those guys and riding with those guys, that changed my whole life and Mm -hmm. trajectory. And just really taught me that I could do anything. Because you could just make it up. Whatever dumb idea you got in your head, you could just do it. Spike Jones is a perfect example of that. Yeah, big time, for sure. I mean... His his imagination, but able to capture reality of what's going on is just it's definitely right. next level, next level stuff. Just doesn't think that he can't do it. Mm-hmm. He's like, no, 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 we can do that. No, we got this. And do you just, think mm-hmm. yeah? I mean, do you think a lot of people currently are just very I guess I, I, I guess the word would be like mind blocking themselves or just with using the word can't? I don't know if they are. I mean, mm-hmm. I fall into the I can't sometimes, and that's just sometimes you just have fear. Um, but I think there are a lot of people doing a lot of cool things, and then and things become a little bit more accessible. Like you know, I've seen it today. I saw a six-year-old kid on a video making beats, mm-hmm. and I was just like blown away. And he was sampling, and and it was like he had a drum machine, and I was just like. Holy cow! He's six oh, years old. I know it's the the little kid that he 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 like he he'll even use like the real instrument and he'll be like, oh, I just want to do this. And then yeah. and then and then he was like, there was one video where he's just like, oh, this is how you make that K Trinata beat. And he did mm-hmm. like the and I was like, I was like, this kid's a talent. Like <laughs> this kid's a prodigy. So, so there are different <laughs> tools now. Yeah. That allow you to you can excel, but again, that kid is just focused on that one thing, mm-hmm. and. <clears throat> I think because the, the net is wide now and there's so many things and so many you know, like, oh, I could be a photographer, I could be this and I could be that, I could do, you know, you get distracted and you, you have to pick a lane. And a lot of people don't, they just want to drive on, you know, on all the lanes. Mm-hmm. And that's great and all, but you have to kind of focus it in on one thing. I mean, that's that's a great point. I think it's funny because I asked somebody else, uh, shout out to I don't know if you know who Jean Grey is, but I I spoke to Jean Grey once and I asked her because she was a person that does many different things. Like she'll <laughs> write, she'll rap, she'll produce, she'll she'll do comedy, she'll do podcasts, like she'll do a ton of stuff. And I remember all and, those things are pretty much along the same plane. Yeah. You know, writing, Mm -hmm. rapping, that's all the same shit. Poetry, same thing. Mm -hmm. It's all part of the same genre. So, yeah, she is doing, she's casting a wider net, but she's still doing the one thing. Mm -hmm. Where you can't be a chef and a skateboarder. Oh, you can. You can do that. But there's, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think that there's um, different different people doing too many different things. Like like the term jack of all trades master of none yes yeah yes. <laughs> I, you can do a lot of things everybody yeah. can do a lot of things but mm-hmm. what are you really good at yeah i think it's it's definitely tough to just be like like i know testing waters or being like okay let me try this stuff okay let me try this stuff but it's all about ca- what captures you the most and then just being like all right this is where i'm at and then just going head down and yep. just staying in that lane. And I think that's, I think I, I suffer from, I, I'm, I'm a jack of all trades and master of none. Cause I can, I do graphic arts. I do video editing. I do podcasts and just like, but it's just like. But all those things are good. And they also, they all sort of lean, lean onto each other. Yeah. So they're, it's still sort of, again, you're still on the same plane. Mm-hmm. And, and because you got to have graphic arts to do the intros and the outros for your videos. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to have that design sense. And then to be able to talk on a podcast, you have to be able to, you know, be able to be interesting. You know, I don't 
think I'm that interesting. No, you're super interesting. Get, <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you're super interesting, man. You live you live one hell of a life. I mean, I'm trying to I just sit in my fucking garage and make paintings and I sort of smoke my little vape thing and I'm like <sighs> No, but you've lived you lived a crazy life. I mean, listen, like you were you just said, which I didn't know, you were part you were a promoter at uh Jeez, I forgot oh, the name Mars. of the club. Yeah, Mars. Um, and so, like, I mean, you you started your own business, right? Yeah. You, you there's also you did the the vodka venture for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you did. Now you also have your your art. You've been doing your art consistently. I've been know? doing my I've been doing my art. My art was always in my life. Yeah, I was ten. You know, and that was what I was saying earlier when you were like, save that. Uh, when I was 10, I first saw this graffiti writer, Is the Wiz. Mm, I love Is. And he just finished this handball court. I just got to school and I was like, mm -hmm. wow. And he was just touching it up and whatnot and finishing the outlines. And then he was, I said, did you paint this? And he was like, yeah. And he was like, you could do it too. And I was like, really? He was like, yeah, it's not that hard. He's like, all you got to do is practice on paper. I was like, huh. And since that day, mm -hmm. I started making art. I started drawing on paper. I started kind of figuring it out. Do, how do I do this? And then I, I got a tag. And I was like practicing inside of a, inside abandoned buildings, how to write and get my hand style. And then, then once I was good enough, I took the tags to the outside of the buildings. And then I started writing. And then, you know, and then it evolved. And then I went to a gallery show and then I saw graffiti on canvas and i was like oh shit i don't have to be in the streets i don't i could do this on canvas and not get arrested oh fuck this started painting on canvas you don't want to go all city man no. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be like way, gandhi man you want to get a train bombing, i went bombing with people and stuff like that but it was fucking batshit crazy it was yeah. You know, this is not for me. I thought, uh, who did I say? Do you ever hear the story? I've been asking everybody this apparently, uh, but everybody who, who messed with graffiti like this. But you ever heard the story of one arm case, uh, right, yeah. that he would carry a shotgun throughout the train yards? No, I didn't know that story. <laughs> that he would literally just have, he would just have big jeans and then he would put the shotgun in one of the pants leg. So that if anybody came up, if you were if you were taking one of his cars, he would just be like shotgun right into your face hmm. and just be like, you got to go. That would do it. <laughs> <laughs> that would do it. But the thing about the shotgun is, don't you have to go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you just you you hold it like this. Well, let me pretend I'm one, one, one arm. <laughs> and then you just go. I mean, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure Case had a, had a way to figure that out. Yeah. Maybe he's pre he pre cocked it and then okay. he's just rolling he's just rolling with the he's just he rolling with gun it. in his leg <laughs> and then he shoots his leg off and he's like one, arm, one leg <laughs> then he's one arm one leg case <laughs> uh, oh man that's the peace case that's the peace case <laughs> um yeah i mean like listen i think it's it's it, graffiti is is uh, i feel like once people get in it it's also just like a gateway to just like, oh, I can do more, you know, or I can, or I can. You get obsessed with it. Yeah. If if you have an obsessive compulsive disorder, graffiti will fucking bring that shit out because you will fucking write your name everywhere. And, and that's basically, I mean, when I, when I started to do the, the meat thing, mm -hmm. um, I, this is in 80, when I was 89, at Mars in the meatpacking district, I started mm -hmm. writing the tag meat because I was around meat all the yeah. time. And we would buy paint because we would do paintings inside the club. Was this the chicken leg or without yes. the chicken? That was the chicken yes. leg? All right. Chicken leg. Mm -hmm. And that was like, I had the word meat, just like Nike. It was four mm -hmm. letters, right? And then I was like, what's going to be my Nike check? So like, because you recognize if you see the check, you go, oh. Oh, that's Nike. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how do I make something? And I started drawing that chicken leg. It was like mad Fred Flintstone style. And I was I like, love it. Was check. Mm -hmm. And the way I did it was I would write on one side of the street the word meat. And on the other side of the street, just the chicken leg. Mm -hmm. And then on the next block, I would write them together. 
And then on the following block, I would cross and I would write the chicken bone and then meat. So like if you walk the three blocks to get from 12th Avenue to 9th Avenue or mm -hmm. 8th Avenue, you would see it all the way down 13th Street. And people understood it, that that was the same person. And it was like, that was my marketing branding strategy. And that's how I started the... Dave's quality me. <laughs> <laughs> you had like a whole you were like, you know what? I'm gonna make this whole this whole block my billboard. Like you're gonna have you're gonna get hit with different different uh, advertisements. There was, where, where the New York office was, which yeah. was one block away from where the nightclub was. Mm -hmm. Like I was in the meatpacking district in 1988 till 2002. Mm -hmm. That's a long fucking time. Yeah, for real. And and, you know, I, I went one block, you know, I was working on 13th Street and West Side Highway. And then I was working at New York and 13th Street in Washington. And I worked at New York. So in our building at 425 West 13th Street, there was a place called Dave's Quality Veal. Mm -hmm. And that's where the name comes from. And I just fucking knocked it off. <laughs> You're like, this is mine I now. <laughs> I did what skate culture does. We just fucking knock shit off. And they're like whatever. I'm just gonna take it. And I took it. Yo, I mean that's that's crazy. I think because I've heard the, I I've heard you say this before, and I used to think like because the whole graffiti part would be like, man, this is just toy. I'm taking it. Like that's what I thought it was. Like, <laughs> no, I just did. I was just like, I bet my friend a dollar that I could turn that into a cool brand. He was like, I'll take that bet. Yeah. <laughs> And then three years or two years into the store being open, he came to my store with a GQ magazine and a dollar in it. And he goes, I know you don't like to read anything. And he goes, but here, check this out. And I opened it up and the GQ magazine called my store the best store in America. And I was just like, all right. That's crazy. You stop. I mean, I hope you frame that. No. Come I on. Dollar out and fucking <laughs> threw the magazine. Threw it out. <laughs> Like, you're like, man, this is meaningless right here. I got a business to run. <laughs> Bobby, the, the inception of it is crazy for because like that that is such a of just like a, a indicative of your personality of just like I could do it. Like I'm gonna do it if I could. I, I believe I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna. I do literally it. got that from Spike Jones. Mm -hmm. He was just like I'm gonna him and him Andy Jenkins and Mark Lumen. They were like, we're going to start a magazine. I was like, you know how to do that? They were like, no, we're just going to do it. <laughs> started a magazine. And I was just like, okay, you literally can do anything you want. All the skateboarders in the world, like, you know, the, the people who are least likely to succeed, everybody called us assholes or dorks or mm -hmm. you fucking kids, get in life, grow up. These are the people that are fucking running the world now. That's true. Uh, were you there when they got the the Nike the Nike SB or the Pro B, uh, and like for the New York magazine that like brown colorway that they were able to oh, do? Oh yeah, I was there. I was there when Eli made that. That's crazy. And we did before that. We did a a New York blazer, mm -hmm. and I did the red, black, and gold one. Eli did the gray and blue one. Yo. That's sick. And we did before that, we did a New York Cortez. Mm -hmm. It never came out. We never came out with that. I have this up in my attic. I have the, uh, the quick strike. Like that's the sampleable. That's sick. I mean, but I mean, it seems crazy to skate in a Cortez, but yeah. That's... But we just made it to chill. It was yeah. like, just, just like, you know, and, and then we were just like, no, nah, this is not going to work. It's going to, it's fabric. It's going to tear apart. And then we were like, ah, let's just not do it. <laughs> I mean that again, yeah. none of us went in with the intentions of like being something that we were like gonna try to change the world with. We were mm -hmm. just like, ah, oh, a few people, well, well, our friends will like it. That's what it but that's what it's about though. And it's like that movie. We made a party for just our friends. Yeah. And you yeah. and behold, the whole fucking world got a wind of it. <laughs> we were like, oh, that's cool. It's funny because like you're saying it like that, but then if you think about it from like my head, and I'm like, your friends happen to be the coolest people that are now known 
Like, but at but the time they were. Yeah, they're not. They were. They, they, they were, were at the time. Another bozo on the bus. <laughs> you know, it was another idiot like me, and uh, and we just kind of like were doing things to just impress like ten people. <laughs> but I think working the small scale like that makes it more. It makes it I'll more. Tell, I tell I told Jonah that when he was yeah. when that movie came out, I was like, listen, man. I was like, the number is ten. Mm-hmm. I was like, you get ten people to like it. That's all you need. After that, everything is gravy. I was like, hey, check it out. You got me, you got your mom's, <laughs> your sister. I was yeah, like, brother. you're seven. <laughs> <laughs> Did like, you show it to the cast? They got to like it. They're in it. <laughs> I, was just like, I was like, seven people, bro. And I was like, that's it. And I was like, don't worry about it. And sure enough, it became this fucking amazing movie. No, yeah, I think I think a lot of people definitely should watch it. It's on it's on not Netflix. It's on Hulu. Um, it's mid nineties. Mid nineties. Check that out. Uh, how about you know what's funny? I've heard, and I don't know if this was true, but the reason I used to come to the shop like almost every day at one point was because I've heard through the grapevine that you were once upon a time would put out a pair of bacon's on the shelves, and then like whoever gets it gets it. And yeah, I was it. Man, I was yeah. never able to, never able to get in on that. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, I just recently sent my my niece a pair of mm-hmm. the new re-release, and um, she was like, "Uncle Dave, can you sign my shoe?" And I never signed shoes, mm-hmm. and I signed first pair of shoes for her. And I was just like, "All right, I'm gonna sign your shoe." And I signed it. You know, Zalea from your Uncle Dave. And, uh, She's super stoked. She got them and she's just like, oh my God. <laughs> she's like, because I promised her the shoe when it came out and yeah. I never sent it because I'm an idiot and I'm just <laughs> like in my own fucking head painting. Mm-hmm. And I always would forget. And then I finally was like, oh, she's not going to mail that thing. Like two years later, <laughs> and then <laughs> mailed it to her and she got them and she was like, nobody believed me. You were my uncle. And I <laughs> she's there at school just I like, like, I like don't tell her to, i was like don't tell them that because they're gonna think i you know they're gonna look me up and then they're gonna see that i'm a weirdo and then, i was like you're probably gonna blow it <laughs> you're gonna be uncool <laughs> stop like, don't tell them that <laughs> the i mean listen is this an opportunity for me to be able to send you my pair so you can sign it for me <laughs> No, I'm not gonna do it. I won't do it. I think that the sneaker looks good by itself. I think Don't sign the shoe. Look. Just sign the sign the box for me. I'll sign the box. <laughs> I just want I the sign the boxes. I sign boxes all day long. I don't care. You send me a box and you know flatten it. Mm-hmm. Send it to me. I'll sign it and I'll mail it back to you. Put a return label in there and I'll just send it back. This is only for me. Anybody listening? This is only for me. <laughs> yeah. Don't send me. Anybody. You'll have my address. They won't. <laughs> they, you could end up getting boxes and boxes and just be like you shouldn't have said that <laughs> no I, I i made that mistake once and I, and I got a bunch of people sent me boxes and i was just like oh. uh, i was like all right i'll do it and i did like 50 boxes once it's like fuck but you know at the end of the day yeah those kids are the ones who are important and they're the ones who make the, the sneaker cool mm-hmm. i mean ultimately when I designed the shoe, I just wanted to make them and get them to Kevin Bacon. Because mm-hmm. I thought that would be hilarious to have I mean, a picture of Kevin Bacon in my Bacons. And then 17 years later, he gets them. And I was just like, oh my God. And then my, <laughs> friend, my other friend, Elijah Wood, did a movie with Kevin mm-hmm. in Belarus. And he was like, yo, Kevin's got your sneakers on. And he texted me and I was like, no shit. <laughs> I was like, and he's like, I told him I was friends with you. He was like, dude, tell your friend I really love these sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, yes, the joke made it. <laughs> <laughs> the joke actually, the joke went all the way to to Bacon. Now, now you have now you now you can do your own seven degrees of Kevin Bacon for yourself. Yes. I am one, and degree, it'd be one. Yeah, <laughs> I am one degree away from Kevin Bacon. Which is well, absolutely hilarious. Now, now I'm two degrees from Kevin Bacon. You are two degrees from Kevin Bacon. How crazy! It's absolutely wild. <laughs> That's like the, when that shoe was created. And I know, I mean, if you, I'm not gonna let, I'm not. You don't have to retell the story, but like, uh, I always found it 
crazy how accurate your depiction of it was and then for them for of an actual like how it looks like an actual piece of bacon in the box uh, on top of each other and like i found it i found it um when they did like the the re-release and they did all the stuff that went with it i don't know if you saw everything that went with it I like saw the hoodie stuff. and stuff like that yeah. like i i was like i was i found it great i bought into all of it because obviously i'm such a hit, big, big fan of yours but like i was just like damn I, well, after i bought the hoodie and they, they used this the the 99 uh like the whole like uh not like the old they use like a a I I feel like somebody saw a picture of your old work of when you used to do uh DQM like your style and mm-hmm. then they were just like oh let's just make merch that looks like that yeah like and no it was great I thought yeah. it was wonderful and you know I was just honored to have the shoe come back out it was Mm -hmm. really hilarious when when we had the conversation and and i was just like i said listen they were like well how many pairs do you want should we do and then you know last last time we only did two thousand pairs and i said you know 17 years ago when i was a younger man Mm -hmm. i thought limited edition was cool Mm -hmm. and i said i'm an older man now and i think unlimited edition is cool and i was like flood the market make thousands of them thousands (laughs) of i was like i want people to wear them ruin them and then if they want another pair they could go get them and that's why you could find them mm-hmm. on resale and they're only twenty dollars above uh, uh retail yeah i flooded the market because mm-hmm. i don't care about it being you know cool and coveted and whatnot i just want people to wear them and like i was saying before i would go out in the street and i'd see people wearing them and i'd be like oh my god those sneakers are so cool and they're like yeah these are the bacons and i'll be like Really? <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of them. Where can I so get them? Tell me about them. And they, they go into it. I'd be listening to like what their version of, you know. What's a, what's a, what's one of them? What's one of the stories that they told you? It's one guy I remember on, on First Avenue in, in St. Mark's, like mm. right near my apartment at the time. And mm-hmm. I was just like, I was like, what do you know about these shoes? I was like, who made them? They were like, this dude made them. And he made them like he made he was hungry for a sandwich. And, he, and they were like, kind of like what the story is. And, mm-hmm. and, and I was like, really? I was like, wow, that guy sounds fascinating. Like, well, what's he look like? And they were like, well, he's this dude, man. He's like mad cool. And then I was like, really? <laughs> and I'm like, I was like, oh my God, I'm mad cool. <laughs> then i was like you know i'm the guy who made those sneakers and they're like get the fuck out of here and i was like google it <laughs> now let's see what you right get now, see if you give me see my picture see who comes up as the picture and then the guy freaked out and his mom and it was just so funny and it was just hilarious and then um we took a picture together and mm-hmm. just, uh, that's 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 dope what like i mean usually i end with a different question but i'm gonna ask you this question that i it's one of the questions that i've always wanted to ask you what does it feel like to have created somebody's grail i don't know i really don't know because at the end of the day i was just making an art piece Mm -hmm. and for me it's just a painting and i make paintings all the time like i'm fucking surrounded by a bunch of my paintings and um it's it's they're like my little babies Mm -hmm. and i create this thing but it's not the end all be all for me because you know i I mean i've created like 25 silhouettes Mm -hmm. of sneakers that people don't even you know everybody talks about bacon they're like bacon i'm like oh yeah i did dunk highs i did dunk lows i did blazers i did this sneaker and you know the blazers are oof i remember trying to listen (laughs) That's and, one of my biggest one. Oh, one of my biggest one of my biggest fails, right? I I rushed to the store when those dropped, thinking that I can if I just get there like an hour early, I'd be good. But no, and I'm like, yo, there's three colorways. There's got to be a size 13 left for me. I get to the front of the line. They're like, nah, we good. We all sold out. I was like, <laughs> no, those those are great. And um, so so yes. It's, it's cool that people like them and it's their grail, as mm-hmm. you said, um, but it's not the final thing for me, you know, because I'm always making stuff. 
I'm always creating. And as long as I'm making stuff, you know, we'll see once I'm gone, you know, uh, what lasts, mm -hmm. what's going to be the thing that, that people, and most likely it'll probably be the bacon, you know? And that's my one hit wonder. You know? No, it's not. You're not a one hit wonder. Stop <laughs> I'm definitely doing not that. a one hit wonder. <laughs> with my new paintings that I'm doing right now, yeah. they're fucking out of control. Yeah, I think you you have. I mean, listen, I, I I've always enjoyed your art, and I think like where it stems from the the gen the uh the genuineness that it stems from, and and it's always 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 been informative like i mean i remember when i first saw the, the goya can like years and years ago like i was just like damn he's he's doing it. he's the next he's the he's 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 I'm andy warhol and andy warhol yeah i was just gonna, he's andy warhol i was Alejandro trying to come, warhol. Yeah, I, was just, I was literally gonna try i was trying <laughs> i was trying i was gonna be like andrea andre uh, andres uh, <laughs> that was a really interesting project that i did because i did all those cans and I did 14 different Goya products. And then I went to Goya mm -hmm. and I was like, hey man, I did this stuff. And they were just like, I don't know if we should sue you or work with you. <laughs> Yo, that would have been sick if they were like, if they were like, you know what? All right, these are great, but we're gonna do like a special edition uh Dave Ortiz cans. <laughs> we, did, we did a can thing and then yeah. I did um the, the the float for the Puerto yeah. Rican parade where I made mm -hmm. big ones and it was wonderful and I got to walk in the parade and it was great and my my the float behind me was with Rosario mm -hmm. who I know her from fucking forever from before. yeah she was a girl and we're still friends to this day like when Rosario when they announced that she was a uh, Ahsoka when she mm -hmm. was a Jedi I was just like, holy shit, I called her up. And I was like, oh my God, you're a fucking Jedi. And she was like, dude, man. Uh, you know, like <laughs> we were talking like we were kids. Yeah. And I was just like, oh my God, I'm one degree away from George Lucas. <laughs> just like you. <laughs> Two degrees now. <laughs> I was just like, fuck. You know, and 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 so it was really wonderful to do that. And and it's just like 50,000 people, you know. Yeah. It was rough way rad and um i was glad to do that project but again that's another you know put it on the pile of things that i've done you know it's 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 i'm kind of like it's it's like well what else can you do mm -hmm. and that's how i keep pushing myself i'm like well now i'm doing all these geometric shape paintings and stuff like that and it's just like all right how do i elevate this from those ores to canvas mm -hmm. and then how do i make that even bigger message how do i you know and i'm always like pushing myself and like all right you can get a little further okay try this now and get out of my comfort zone because mm -hmm. once you start getting into your comfort zone and then you start making the same thing over and over it gets kind of boring mm -hmm. it's like you know you have to keep pushing the envelope and making and changing your style and making something better you know, and that's yeah. what I do. I just kind of like keep pushing. You know, people like when I'm done, and they look back and they're gonna be like, "Holy fucking Christ, this guy did he ever sleep?" <laughs> and you're gonna be like, "No, I did it." <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I get up early. I'm, I'm up at five a.m. Yeah, and then I'm already thinking about what I'm gonna finish in the studio and what's the next painting. That's but that's that's, that's how crazy I am. I mean, look, I don't think that's crazy. That's just that you have the passion. The passion fuels you. And, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't stay in one lane in order to keep yourself, you know, always ambitious of what's next. So, yeah, you have to. Yeah. You can't, you can't sit down because the moment you sit down, that's it. It's a wrap. And I mean, I just kind of like get myself, I stay hungry, mm -hmm. you know? It's it's really important, you know, when you got a lot of dough or whatever, and you you're just like, yo, what am I gonna do today? It's like, nah, I gotta work, son. I gotta <laughs> grind. I don't care. I gotta keep moving, hustling. You know, mm -hmm. how can I do this? All right, I'm gonna do something that's not conventional. I paint, paint on these shoe glass, and I'm gonna paint on these barrels, and I'm gonna paint on this thing, and like, how can I make that be like a, you know 
a painting mm -hmm. and, and really just push yourself trying to step out of the norm like i've always done just like okay we're just gonna make something completely fucking bonkers but it's still gonna be fresh mm -hmm. and people when they look at the, the barrels and stuff they're just like holy fucking crap I'm like this guy's insane and i'm like yeah a little bit <laughs> <laughs> Well, let everybody know where they can find you, Dave. Um, you can find me on Instagram mm -hmm. at one two three D Ortiz, and my website is daveortiz.nyc. Mm -hmm. It's very good. You got lots of art out there. Uh, yeah, make sure you check out all his stuff. Uh, and for everybody out there, you know what we say every week: wear your kicks. Peace. Wear them. <laughs>